I watch a lot of games of 40k, whether they're for coverage on stream, just other people's streamed games, or just games in our Discord. Link down in the description, by the way. Quick shout out. Come play 40k with us. And I noticed that there are some common rules that are often misunderstood by people. And I mean, with good reason, the rules of 40k are very complicated. So let's talk about eight rules that are often misinterpreted and misplayed and how to play them correctly. What's up folks, welcome back to Tactical Tortoise. My name is Trevi and today we're gonna be going through some of the weirdest rules in Warhammer 40k and how you are supposed to play them correctly. Warhammer 40k is a complex game. There's a lot of rules in it. Unfortunately, Games Workshop has a pathological fear of templating their rules. So a lot of times things in different phases or using different profiles work slightly differently from one place to another. And today we're gonna talk about some of those weird interactions and how you're supposed to resolve them on the tabletop. If you enjoy this style of content and you find this video useful, please go ahead, drop a like drop a subscribe on the video really helps let me know what kind of videos people like to see and if you have any strange rules that you see people misplay all the time or that you have a question about that aren't included in this video go ahead and throw it down in the comments down below do all that youtube stuff you know the the youtube stuff Anyway, let's get into these rules and let's start with how you're appropriately supposed to measure distance between units for attacks versus measuring for psychic powers. Now, normally when you're measuring between units, you measure between the closest points of the bases or hulls, if you are you have a unit that hull measures, of the two closest models in those units. However, this changes when you're trying to target them with a ranged attack. According to the ranged weapon targeting rules in the shooting phase, when you measure for a ranged attack, you have to drop both range for your weapon and line of sight to a single model in the target unit, which means that even if the two closest units are within weapon range, if the models you can see in that unit are outside of the range of your weapon, you are still not able to target that unit. This changes, however, when you go to the psychic phase. The psychic phase has its own targeting rules and still considers the two closest models in each unit when measuring the range for a psychic power. So this is a little confusing, so let's go to an example to help elucidate things. So I'm trying to shoot with my tactical squad here, and they have a model with a flamer. Flamer is a 12-inch range weapon, and so I would need to target an orc if I wanted to shoot in this orc unit that is both within 12 inches of the flamer model and in line of sight of him. Now, unfortunately, the orcs are pretty craftily hiding behind this box, and while the orcs behind the box are within 12 inches of the flamer model, I can't see them for line of sight. The only model in the orc unit that the flamer guy can see is just outside 12 inches, which means that even though I have both visibility to the unit and range to the unit, technically I need both to the same model, which I do not have, and that makes the orcs an ineligible target for the tactical marine. Now this changes when you talk about psychic powers. So let's say I have a librarian here and he's gonna try to cast a psychic power on the orc unit. This works the same whether the power is smite, which has to go towards the closest enemy unit or a targeted power. But when I measure range for the target unit, I measure between the closest models, which means that we're 12 inches away. And then I measure visibility to any model in the unit. So even if, for example, the librarian was back here and outside 18 inches of this, the only orc boy that it can see, if it wanted to cast smite or another similar effect offensive power on them, because the closest model in the unit is within 18 inches, they will still be hit by that smite or whatever that offensive power is, despite the fact that I don't have both range and line of sight to the same model. So the range and line of sight restrictions are only for the shooting phase, otherwise you measure to any model in the unit for both range and line of sight. Next up, another rule I see misplayed relatively commonly is how you're supposed to treat models that overhang their bases significantly. Now, according to the measuring distances section of the rulebook, if your model has a base and it does use base measurement, so it doesn't have a rule like the grav tank rule that tells you to measure from its hull, the game essentially only considers your model for measurement purposes as the little black disc that's underneath it. The actual plastic or resin or digital figurine that's hovering above the base doesn't matter for measurement or placement purposes. I see a lot of comments on the channel, people talking about the physical size of models being restricted for its movement. And unless your model hull measures, that doesn't actually come into account at all. So for example, a Hive Tyrant is an example I love to use, given that the model is so physically large, especially in real life, that it overhangs over its base pretty significantly. Now that means that according to the rules, I am allowed to place my model up against 
this wall like this, despite the fact that the physical model, the you know, the plastic figurine in this case, would be protruding into the wall. Now, this is something we can do easily on Tabletop Simulator because your models can phase through other models. But in real life, the core rules suggest that you use the Waddly Model Syndrome tips to, instead of placing the model here, just mark its actual position to your opponent and then take the actual model and put it in a close approximation of that position so that your opponent knows where it is. Now, one thing that we do in real life is we use proxy bases, essentially just a spare base that you have lying around or a cutout that's the same size as the base to represent the location of the model in terms of measuring. And then you can just put the actual model wherever you can physically put it for the purposes of measuring line of sight. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that this can cause some weird issues if your model is physically larger than the area it's going into. On Tabletop Simulator, like I said, it's a lot easier for us, but if your model does protrude through a wall or a building like that, it will be able to be seen through the building. This is something you'd have to discuss with your opponent. So generally speaking, you don't wanna actually like try to overlap your model with a terrain piece, but that terrain piece doesn't actually stop the physical placement of your model. Now this changes if you have a model that uses hull measurement instead of a base measurement. So a vehicle like this truck here doesn't have a base to measure from, so it just considers every part of its model as its base, essentially, which means that not only can it not protrude into terrain in any way, and even the guns and things on top of it won't be able to overlap into the terrain like we're doing here, that would be an illegal position for that model. But also in cases where there's multiple stories on a building, it can be possible for the second story to actually physically stop the truck from being able to go in. That's not the case for models that base measure. As long as you can squeeze your base underneath the second level, you're allowed to be placed there. But for vehicles and hull measurement stuff like that, it can actually, second stories can actually stop them from entering buildings. Next up, let's talk about flying models and when models are actually allowed to fly. It is a little confusing because flying models typically behave differently in different phases, but the general gist is that during the movement phase, a model with the fly keyword will be able to move over models and ignore vertical distance for moving over terrain. However, in the charge phase, while they retain the ability to fly over models, they lose the ability to fly over terrain without penalty. Now, this sounds a little weird. Essentially, what it means is that flying models can go over terrain for free. So if I wanted my Vanguard veteran here, for example, to just fly over this building, instead of having to count the distance to move up to each floor and then move back down, I'm just going to move them in a straight line, basically like the board was a two-dimensional play space, essentially. Now, the reason for this is that anytime a model moves along the battlefield, and the battlefield in the rulebook is defined as the play space that you're playing in and the edges of all of the terrain features, so the vertical distance that you move up and down terrain is, is part of the battlefield as well. And when you move along the battlefield, the movement that you use is the total distance that you move along that surface. So for example, when a model moves up the floors of a building, Technically, we'll have to move up to a wall, uh, 7.5 inches, we'll call it there, and then measure the distance to move up to the second floor of that building if they wanted to get to the second one. So that's about three inches, so that would be a 10-inch move to get to that second floor. You do have to do this along the edges of the battlefield, which means that you do have to do it up and down walls, for example. Your models actually have to have something to climb. They can't just move underneath a floor and then teleport to the top. The benefit of having fly is that you ignore that vertical distance that you're measuring up and down when you go to move that model. So during the movement phase, this Vanguard veteran would technically, to do his 12-inch movement, be moving up to the wall, popping up as as tall as as high as the tallest point of the building goes, another, you know, probably six or seven inches, then moves down another six or seven inches, then continues his his uh, horizontal movement there. But because you ignore all of this stuff, you're just going to treat it in a straight line. Now, that's only how flying works in the movement phase. In the charge phase, again, they lose the ability to measure that vertical distance, which means that, for example, if I were to be standing on top of this ruin, let's say I want to charge the orc boys down here, instead of being able to measure the, vert the horizontal distance, I would also then have to take into account the vertical distance when I go to make my charge. So it's going to be three inches to get my base to the bottom, probably four and a half if we include the uh, the width of my base and then another inch to get actually into melee. So it would be like a five inch charge, despite the fact that we're only on a two dimensional plane about two or three inches away. 
Now, this sounds very annoying and confusing, and you're not wrong, but I think it helps to explain kind of the story behind this. And this might be a little apocryphal, but the way I understand it, and this is a little bit before my time playing 40K, when Games Workshop, when they're, they're coverage team would go to big tournaments like Nova Open or LVO to stream games, they would bring a table of terrain with them, and they would use the terrain setup rules that the event were using, but with the, their own terrain that they, they built. And that included some very tall buildings, I think that were about this tall, these big, huge eight inch buildings or so. And what players quickly found out is if, if you were playing with a large building like that, what they could do is because all measurement in the game is from the your base to the metal, your measuring space, if they went to deep strike, let's say we deep strike a unit of Vanguard veterans or whatever, and there was a, a, an enemy unit down here, they would have to deep strike more than nine inches away. So they would. this would be nine inches. But because flying used to ignore the vertical distance when charging, you would approach this as a two-dimensional plane when you would actually go to charge that unit. So it would only end up being about a three-inch charge because you would move across and then you would basically drop down to the floor uh, for free with your fly move. The, <laughs> the coverage team saw that on their table. They got a little upset with that. So the rule was changed uh, to stop that from happening. I don't know 100% if that's true. That's the story that I heard in and I think it's funny, but it does help to illuminate why the charging rules work in this strange way. I've seen a lot of confusion over these particular rules in the past, so hopefully this clears things up just a little bit. Now, speaking of flying, another rule that I see players get wrong all the time, and even really good players <laughs> in some high-profile situations. One inch is around your starting position. That is incorrect. Uh, you can swap it to my time for this, because I'm calling the judge. Okay. Uh, does it not have to move uh, actually 20 inches away from where it started on the table? Uh, yeah, mi a minimum move is uh, is the amount of distance that you have to be from where you started. It's not the amount that you move. So you'll have to go like another more six, six more inches or so. Shame. 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 Is the aircraft rules. Now, aircraft have a minimum movement characteristic which ostensibly means they have to move that much every movement phase, but it doesn't ent entirely mean that. Some aircraft don't have the normal aircraft rule that requires them to move in straight lines, which means that a minimum movement characteristic would allow them to just sort of like vibrate in place an infinite amount of times in order to make up their minimum movement. And it would essentially mean that the minimum movement characteristic would not matter. This is the case for, I think for Remora stealth drones is the one that I can think of off the top of my head. There's also flyers that can pivot multiple times during their movement phase, even if they are moving in straight lines. And so that can make it very easy to make up a minimum movement without actually move traveling that far across the table. And for that reason, minimum movement for aircraft is not in fact the amount of distance that you have to travel when you're moving it's the distance from your starting location that you have to end your move so if i have an archaeopter here and this is probably the the single unit that this comes up for most often which is a flyer that does have to move directly forward in straight lines but it can pivot at the start of its movement phase and it can pivot one additional time 90 degrees during its movement phase so for example if i wanted to take this archaeopter and move it 10 inches directly forward then take a 90 degree pivot and move another 10 inches because it has a 20 inch minimum movement. So here's a 90 degree pivot and we move it another 10 inches. We can see that it would only end about 10 inches from its starting point. Now this is much less than the 20 inches that the minimum movement characteristic is. So despite the fact that we've moved 20 inches across the table on two different legs of our journey, unfortunately that's an illegal placement for the Archaeopter. It has to keep going until it gets at least 20 inches away from its starting position. This is something to keep in mind if you play against a lot of aircraft. Just make sure that your opponents uh, keep in mind that despite the fact that they can pivot multiple times potentially during a single movement, they do have to end 20 inches from where they started or whatever their movement characteristic is. While we're talking about vehicles, let's talk about disembarking from transports. Now, one very common misconception that I just want to get out of the way right now with transports and their interaction with objective secured troops, a lot of people think that if you embark units onto a transport, they'll confer their abilities to the transport. So, for example, if you have a troops unit, like a unit of Orc Boys or Imperial Guardsmen or Tactical Marines that are embarked into a transport that the transport will then also get objective secured, that's not correct. Off the top of my head, I don't believe that there are any dedicated transports in the game that, that get objective secured. Once you destroy it and the units come out, they then could objective secure the objective that they're on away from their opponent, but until they're destroyed and they're on the table, they don't objective secure anything from you. But speaking of destroyed transports, let's get back to how to disembark from them. 
Now, disembarking has a pretty strict procedure that you have to go through in order to perform it properly. And I see a lot of players uh, sort of doing this a little bit the wrong way, and it can sometimes give them unfair advantages. When you're disembarking from a vehicle that's destroyed, the first thing that you do is you place all of your models on the table. Now, this may only matter in a situation where your landing spaces uh, are restricted. So, for example, if we have a truck and it's been surrounded by space marines here, so they're trying to make it difficult for the orc boys inside to get out, you do have to place those orcs wholly within three inches of the truck and outside of an inch of enemies. So we can see that the Space Marines have probably pretty effectively blocked off a lot of the places that we can position these boys. Now, the first thing that you do as soon as that truck is destroyed is you place every single model within those constraints. So it can wholly within three inches of the truck and outside of an inch of enemies. Any models that can't are immediately automatically destroyed. So these orc boys will be gone. Then you go ahead and remove the truck and only then do you roll to see if the remaining models in the unit get killed as a result of the truck dying. So they'll die on the roll of a 1 or a 1 or a 2 if you use the emergency disembarkation stratagem. So that does not mean, for instance, that you're able to remove the truck, then place the disembarked models where the truck was. You can't do that. And you can't also see if any of your models die before placing them. You have to be able to place them first, and then you only roll to see if the models die that were successfully placed. Now, lookouts are, or the ability to protect character models with your other units is another little bit of a strange role than one that's a little bit hard to get your head around. I see a lot of players play it in slightly different ways, so I'm just going to go through essentially how the rule works. If you played in 8th edition and you played in the 8th edition codex, the lookout sir rules actually should be pretty familiar to you since they're very similar to the character protection rules that the 8th edition book had with a couple extra stipulations. So what does Lookouts do? Let's just go over it from the top. Basically, if your character model is within three inches of another unit that can potentially provide Lookouts, they gain the benefits of being protected by Lookouts. Now, what that means is that if any other unit in your army is closer to the attacking models than the character is, then they cannot target it. In addition, the character must be visible to the shooting unit in order for it to be targeted. So, for example, if I had my librarian directly at the front of my army with no other friendly units in front of it, if there were these org boys here that were closer to the librarian than they were to the other units in my army, they could shoot that librarian. However, if there was a piece of artillery that shot indirect fire that was hiding behind a building somewhere in the back, it could not target my librarian. Despite the fact that it might be the closest model, if the unit shooting can't see it, they can't shoot it. This does not apply, however, to the units that could potentially be screening the librarian. So, for example, in this situation, if the librarian is within range of my tactical squad to be lookout served for here, he cannot be shot if any other model from my army is to the attacking unit than the target is. So, this if this Vanguard veteran is hiding behind this box here, as long as he is closer to these orc boys than the librarian is, despite the fact that the orc boys can't see the Vanguard veteran, he's still protecting the librarian from being shot. Now, the reason that this should be relatively familiar to 8th edition players is that this is almost exactly how the 8th edition lookouts or rules worked. In this case, you just need to have a little bodyguard unit for your character model. And if you do, it doesn't matter what else is protecting him. As long as something else is closer than he is, you, can, you can't shoot him. This also applies if, if the lookout serving for unit is not visible. So, for example, if the librarian is in front of this wall, but the unit protecting him is behind the wall, it does still provide lookout sir, even if the shooting can't unit cannot see the lookout sir foring unit. <laughs> The lookout sir rules are a little bit confusing. Like I said, I think it's a little bit easier if you have played in 8th edition because you played with similar rules in the past, but it is something to keep in mind. The units screening for the characters do not have to be visible to protect them from enemy units shooting at them. Next up, let's talk about which units can fight in the fight phase. I see this one get misconstrued all the time, constantly. And there is a public perception, I guess, that a unit that has been declared as a charge target can fight in the fight phase regardless of whether or not there are enemy and any enemy units there. I think part of this comes from the fact that many abilities that trigger when you charge also trigger when you're declared as the target of a charge, but you do not count as charging when you are charged, only 
when you charge. On the whole, the only units that are eligible to be chosen to fight in the fight phase are either units that have performed a charge that turn or units that are currently engaged with enemies. The same is true for heroic intervention. So let's talk about some instances where you would be charged but not able to fight in the fight phase. Oh. For example, if we were to set up a situation here where this tactical squad charged into this truck and these orc boys, they performed their pile in and consolidate and they beat on this truck quite a bit, then they were done. Maybe let's say they didn't do too much damage. If the orc boys then activate next to fight back and come in to fight the tactical marines and kill them, this truck would not then be eligible to fight because even though it was charged in the fight phase, when it comes its turn to fight, all of the units within an inch of it are dead. And because it didn't charge itself, it's not then able to activate and pile in and consolidate. Similarly, if the orcs charge into these tactical marines and they trigger a heroic intervention off of the librarian here who can move three inches to engage them. If the orcs make all of their attacks, then the, attack the tactical marines fight back and kill the orcs, despite the fact that the librarian performed a heroic intervention, which sometimes feels like a charge. Because he didn't actually charge this turn, he's still not going to be able to activate in the fight phase, so he just hangs out and doesn't do anything. That is something to keep in mind that it's very important in many games of 40k. The only models that can fight in the fight phase are ones that either performed a successful charge that turn or are currently engaged with enemy units. And that can mean that in some situations, there can be game states where a unit was charged, the unit charging them was not destroyed, but the unit is still not able to attack. For example, we see this happen in competitive games quite a bit. If this Vanguard veteran charges into these Orc Boys and this truck, because it's closer to the truck here than it is to the Orc Boys, it can then use its Consolidate move to move out of engagement range of the Orcs. So despite the fact that the Orc Boys were charged, and their enemy is standing right over here. Unfortunately, they aren't within an inch of it, and they didn't perform a charge by themselves, so they are not eligible to activate in that phase. Now, last, but I don't know, maybe least, we'll move away from sort of core rules, and we'll move to some more mission-specific stuff for the last bullet point on our list of commonly misplayed rules here, and those are actions. Actions are becoming very important in Warhammer 40k. Not only a lot of faction-specific secondaries are, are picking them up, but also a lot of non-objective-focused things are getting related to actions. There's the action in the Necron Codex, for example, to move your Star Steals around. And I think we're going to be seeing a lot more of those pop up as more Codexes get released. So it's important to know when you can or cannot perform an action. Now, this is only for standard actions. Psychic actions are a totally different thing entirely. And... Standard actions only turn off if the unit performs a movement phase style movement. So that's a normal move, advance, fall back, or remain stationary. Not pile in and consolidates. Tries to perform a psychic power or a ranged attack, or declares a charge or heroic intervention. This means that actions can still be completed if you are fighting enemy units in melee. So for example, if I were to start an action on an objective, then my opponent was to move on to that objective and charge my unit. As long as my unit doesn't die, even if it makes a pile in, consolidate, and makes melee attacks, because it didn't charge or heroically intervene itself, the action will still complete normally. So it's basically impossible to break an action just by engaging the enemy unit performing it, despite the fact that they can't be in an engagement range when they start to perform the action, even if they're in, within an engagement range at the end, as long as they didn't do any of the things that we talked about before, they're still fine to complete that action. Additionally, a lot of secondary objective style actions target specific objective markers, and you cannot perform them when an enemy unit is in range of that objective marker. One thing to keep in mind is that it doesn't care who is controlling that objective marker at that time. For example, you're trying to raise the banners high on an objective marker in your deployment zone, and you have a bunch of objective secured units. Even if one enemy model that's not objective secured is within range of that objective, you cannot attempt to, to raise that banner. You have to entirely clear the objective first before you're able to start performing that action. So just keep in mind that while a lot of actions do target those objectives, it doesn't matter who controls the objective at the time you're targeting them. Most of the time, your opponent has to have no models within three inches of that objective marker in order for that action to be successfully completed. That's more of a mission-specific thing. It doesn't happen quite as often as some of the core rules we talked about today, but I do think that it is worth mentioning. So anyway, those are eight rules that are commonly misplayed in Warhammer 40k and that you now know how to perform correctly. So now, when you go to the, your local game store, you can, uh, you can you know, push your glasses up and you can say, well, actually, every time you see someone misresolving a rule, take that, other people who didn't read the rulebook as well or watched this video. <laughs>
I want to thank everybody for watching all the way through to the end of the video. I really appreciate it. Like I said at the top, if you did enjoy this video and you and you have some rules that you're not 100% sure how they work or are you see commonly misplayed, go ahead and throw those down in the comments. I want to throw a big thanks to my Patreon supporters over at patreon.com slash tactical tortoise. Also, channel members. Those folks are awesome as well. And all those people get some super cool benefits for helping support the channel. You get early access to videos. Patreon supporters can get some exclusive videos that we have some more of coming out shortly and early access to T5S2 pods. Thanks again for watching to the end of the video. I do really hope that it was helpful to you. Remember to keep it classy, folks, and have happy wargaming.